six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. We have commit and we have lift off at two thirteen. Clear the tower. Prepare yourself for a world of seriousness. This is Good morning, everyone. Conley here with the Science Night in the morning. Yep, it's me and Sean here with you. And uh, we are going to have a really fun show for you today, especially if you're a big 007 fan or if you like uh, anything that deals with uh, manipulation, deception, maybe you like uh, Big Brother or uh, what, what are some of those other like deceptive shows out there, Sean? What do you what do you think? Yeah, I'm trying to think of, uh, well, you know, the ultimate example, I guess, of the topic we're going to talk about would be uh, anybody our age would know it. The Transformers. Oh, yeah. Transformers. Right? Yeah. Which, conceal themselves very deviously as just ordinary cars <laughs> or F-16s and then transform themselves into diabolical robots. Ah, uh, yeah, the Decepticon. Yeah, Decepticon. Yeah. I, I, was, I started as a Voltron. I was a He-Man kid, and then I went into Thundercats, and then I went into Voltron, and then I kind of dabbled a little bit in Transformers with the Decepticon. I thought yeah, that was cool. Yeah. That's so. that's about yeah, all, all that in G.I. Joe was my childhood. <laughs> and of course, I wasn't I wasn't allowed to watch cartoons. My parents what? were uh yeah, they don't and I'm kind of I, I see why not now, of course. <laughs> right. And it it explains like, a lot, Sean. Yeah, and uh they they made me watch nature shows instead, and you can that kind of makes sense. But yeah. I still, whenever I could, I still tried to sneak in uh, cart you know, those cartoons whenever possible. So I, nice. I love GI Joe. I loved Heat Man, Transformers. Yeah, all, all a lot of fun. But I relate to you because you know back then we didn't have like real TV or cable or anything. Uh, here, my yeah. dad had a monitor and a VCR, and he had he was a scientist, right? Yeah, so yeah, he we had all these nature programs. And dinosaur programs with Jack Horner, uh, yeah, yeah, Carl Sagan, Cosmos, and yeah, Cosmos, I mean, tons of back when Discovery was actually the Discovery Channel or yeah. the Learning Channel yeah. was actually the Learning Channel before my 600 yeah. pound life and 90 day fiance and stuff like that. Like, <laughs> they actually taught yeah. people things, you know, yeah, uh, <laughs> very good. Yeah, my the first uh documentary I ever watched. And one of the earliest things, one of my earliest memories was watching The Living Planet with, which is David Attenborough. Yeah. With, with, you know, it was like the planet Earth before the first planet Earth, you know. So, yep, that's good stuff. And they don't make them like they used to. That's for sure. Uh, that's for sure. We're, we're trying to hold the hold the flame here on Science Nights in the Morning, giving you real information and not a bunch of bogus bull crud. <laughs> trying to channel the spirit of David Attenborough in, in a way here. Um, yeah if you believe in spirit sean but <laughs> <laughs> but anyway oh. <laughs> uh today's topic is uh a definitely a fun one because we're going to talk about mimicry in nature now it takes uh a lot for evolution to kind of roll its roll along its merry way right and um when evolution kind of leads a species into another species uh, it's very interesting. Now, we talked about that in uh, Convergent Evolution uh, a few yeah. episodes ago. Well, I thought this would be a really good follow-up episode discussing um, animals or plants even that take like almost a doppelganger, right? Yeah. Of something else. Yeah. In order you to survive. That, you, yeah, you set this up really well because I think it, at its at its heart, mimicry, biological mimicry is very – it's like the ultimate convergent evolution, hmm. right? That's really what it is. Yeah. Uh, it, it, you're you're getting, you know, selection for a body type or a body shape or color that's so good that like specialists have a hard time telling the two species apart. They're that close, and and that's that's essentially what convergent evolution is. I mean, that's it, and and with mimicry, it's even more it's even more convergent than your average convergent evolution. 
like the the similarity between a thorny devil in Australia and a horned lizard in Texas is pretty superficial. Like any any anybody would look at them and go, "Wow, they look similar, and they look and they act similar, and they eat similar things, and they live in the desert." Those are all similarities, but I can easily tell them apart. Mm. But some of these mimicry examples, like it's uncanny how similar they can look to each other. And and it and it's through basically the same process. It's selection. In the case of convergent evolution, you know, it's it's a lot of different selection forces can be at play. It can be the environment, climate, it can be predators. But with mimicry, at least the kind of mimicry where one species looks exactly like another, it's usually predation that's the selection force. It's mm. strict predation. It's you know, <laughs> if the if the bird finds you and mistakes you for the toxic version. And lets you go, that's mimicry. And it's funny because it's nature using nature against nature. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, just like every ex I've ever had, like you know, there's someone <laughs> using someone against someone, and uh, that's just how it goes sometimes. <laughs> anyway, I'm gonna leave my past in the in the past, and uh, we'll we'll continue on uh, with this because I, I'd like to start out with, I'd like to make this episode kind of grow a little bit. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. um, as in grow, I want to talk a little bit about plant mimicry. We touched on it in uh, Convergent Evolution, but I uh, kind of want to get a little depth into it. And it'll be a good intro and kind of bridge into this next level. Right. Yeah. Especially yeah. Well, for so we'll listeners start when they're we'll learning. Start kind of start kind of slow and get more and more ridiculous. Yeah. I like yeah, that. I'm That's totally down. Idea. I'm totally down. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, peyote. Uh, La Fafra, I believe, is the mm -hmm. mm -hmm. scientific name for it. Mm -hmm. um, well, that looks just like a rock. And if you're going out, especially here in far out West Texas, and you're looking for it, um, it's always been said that you'll never find it until it finds you, right? It's a <laughs> spiritual thing, right? That's amazing. That's a really good way of putting it. <laughs> and yeah. and when, once you see it, then you realize it's all around you. Yes. And, and it's, it, you know, it's otherwise it's invisible yeah. and it looks yeah. literally just like a little rock that's yeah. inside other rocks. And it even has a really intricate kind of root structure. It looks kind of like an ice cream cone. Like, yeah. so half of it, it it's like mm -hmm. a little cone underground and on yeah. top is like the little top of the ice cream. Yeah. There's more, more of it underground than above, right? There's more right. root mass than, than stem mass. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, what's funny about that is that it has no predation. It has zero, no, right. nothing, yeah. except for poachers. Well, like Martin, Martin Terry, our, our mutual friend and botanist, yeah. he, I was asking him that question. I was like, do we, is, is it, has anyone ever noticed any, anything trying to eat it or is a pot? And he, he said that, he, that there's some snail that does some grazing on it. Ah, okay. So there, there may be, and, and that's unstudied and it's probably anecdotal. It's just like somebody saw a snail. But that's interesting because that would suggest that that snail has come up with some sort of an enzyme. And that's usually the way it works. Like for, for whatever defense that plants come up with, there, there seems to always be some little insect that can create an enzyme that can counteract the toxin, in this case, yeah. mescaline. And, and then it can become specialized on that plant and feed only on that plant. So yeah. it's kind of won the lottery. It's, it's, it's like the only, but like, still though, you're right. I mean, like in terms of numbers of species that feed on peyote, it's abysmally low compared to some of these, like even something like a prickly pear with all of its defenses, right? You'll find them damaged. Peccaries, javelinas, even deer, uh, even things like bears. A lot of times they'll feed on cacti, even though it hurts like hell, yeah. just to get the water, right? Right? It'd be yeah. like during a drought. And, and that even you could do that. Yeah. If you're really suffering in the desert and you got a pocket knife, Cut into some prickly pears and and suck on them. That's a good that's a good thing to do. Um, there's even some cacti you can cut open and really get some legit water from. But prickly pears aren't that good for that. Anyway, so yeah, herbivores defenses, but the peyote has that really interesting rock mimicry that it does. Yeah, it's a stone mimic, and it, you know this is a good example of a bunch of things what, what you brought up. It's a stone mimic, so it's it's mimicking. It's not mimicking necessarily another animal or plant. It's mimicking some inanimate object, and that's mm -hmm. really common in nature, right? There's things that mimic rocks, thorns, sticks, leaves, and that's pretty common. That's it's a kind of a 
different kind of mimicry of just based on general resemblance. And we'll kind of distinguish between that and like the more hardcore mimicry where it's mimicking another animal or plant. When we get to the more bananas examples of mimicry, we're going to grow into, like you said. Sure. Uh, but the, the so there's stone mimics. And then you mentioned that this really cool thing that's a really important part of this is this idea that once you figure out what you're looking for, they're everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And this this is something that animals have too, right? Mm -hmm. that it's called a search image. And this is something like, you know, these people are developing AI and trying to understand yeah. vertebrate consciousness. They really need to know about this because this is something you can do. You know, it, it's like until you know what it looks like, you can't see it. And that suggests that there's like there's this part of your brain probably mm. associated with the optic lobes and the tip like up in the frontal area where our brain processes imagery. There's there's this image like a template, like a target that you're you're looking for and it, and it locks up when your eyes actually meet that target. Right. Yeah. And so those two things match each other, the one in your brain and the thing that's out there. And then you see it. It's a search image. And we know, we know that things like hawks, even snakes, through various experiments, we know that they have a search image. They do the same thing. Wow. And so it makes sense that, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be humans that drive the evolution of mimicry, although I bet in many cases it is, because we are very visually oriented and there's a lot of us out there and we kill a lot of things. But things like birds of prey, which have even better eyes than us, they form those mental images in their head too, and they try to link them up with their the prey in their environment. And if they don't find it, they're invisible. Right. And so it's the same thing with birds of prey, with hawks, uh, that search image idea. And so that's the idea. You know, if you can defeat the search image, if you can make yourself look so ordinary that nothing will match you up with the typical prey they're looking for, then you just get a free pass. Wow. Yeah. No, that's, that's brilliant too, because, um, you know, with, with these plants, it's like they seek, uh, you know, they, uh, seek a nursing plant, you know, they're, they're usually yeah. around other things to help even disguise them more. Right. You They'll know? be even and, less conspicuous under, under a bush than, yeah. Out well, it seems like a lot of these species that we're going to be talking about today require, you know, other things, you know, like a walking stick. If you take like, yeah, a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the insect a real yeah. long kind of katie dead looking uh insect and yeah. it's out it, it needs all the rest of the brush or else it's going to stick yeah. out like a yeah. sore thumb We're, yeah you always find walking sticks walking off like on a highway and you're like what is it doing out there so like, <laughs> it doesn't it know that it's you know exposed yeah. yeah and that's there is there is a bit of a behavioral co um uh co component to this right for, with animals because those things like walking sticks and caterpillars that like to look like twigs, like a caterpillar that looks like a twig doesn't look like a twig unless it sticks out straight. Mm. Right. And they'll right. do that. They spend their time sticking out straight off of a little branch. And that's obviously like a little behavioral adaptation that went along with the structural adaptation. Mm. That it, 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 so they, they'll do the behavior and they'll do, they've got the, you know, body shape that makes them look like a stick. So a lot of times behavioral traits will go hand in hand, like the example of the horn lizard that looks like a rock and they hunch whenever they think they've been spotted to yeah. make themselves look even more like a rock. Wow. That's the, that's a little behavior that goes with it. And, you yeah. know, like the swaying that these little like mantises will do to make themselves look like, like they're in the wind. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so the, yeah, a walking stick's a good example, but you know, a, the, a couple examples here of where it's not always perfect. Nothing's ever perfect. The walking stick walking across a highway, he's broken the rule, right? So yeah. if he gets munched on by like a, a you know, a a, 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 yeah, like a night hawk or a poor will, that one, you know, so there there is a penalty for doing the wrong thing. So he'll get eaten, and maybe the ones that hang out and stay in the creosote bush and never leave are the ones that can keep having babies. That's how it works. And then um, the peyote, right? Yeah. It's a really good mimic of a rock, but it's not as good as it could be. Right. Because you can see what an even better peyote it would be in the living stone succulents of Africa. Sure. Right. Those are and even better rock Just mimics. like rocks. Yes, they're, they're even better than peyote. So peyote actually kind of, it's got maybe another 2 million years of evolution wow. before it looks perfect, right? So there's always, there's always, 
there's always room for improvement with sub with, with arguably some exceptions. Some are so freaking good that like I cannot imagine there could ever be improvement. But in many cases, there is room for improvement. Walking sticks on the wrong background. Peyote's not quite as good as it could be. So that's to keep in mind that like mimicry isn't always diabolical. Sometimes it can be, but and it's all. very interesting that you talk about our our own mind or the the mind of any kind of species, right? Because like we we observe these uh, species in nature, like you say, and, and we have yeah. an idea of what they are. So we're actually looking for it, right? But when when you look into an optical illusion, you don't really know what you're looking for. Exactly. You don't get it until you get it. Yes. Right. That's, and that's so it's kind of playing mind. the part. That's to keep in mind when you're thinking about mimicry um, is that, yeah, like you have to assume that th th when you're thinking, oh, wow, this 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 would probably be good to fool a predator. You have to pr uh, assume that the predator has never flipped through a biology textbook right. and read into mimicry. You know, you sure? it's just out there looking for food. And so the chances that they're going to overlook some of these things is pretty darn good. Yeah. The way I kind of describe it is like, you, you remember those uh, optical illusions we used to uh, use in school where it was yeah. very like kind of snowy and then you'd like pull it away and you just kind of yep. look at it in a certain way and then boom you could see a just, green <laughs> image yep. oh yep. well if you just flashed that with no context at all and yeah. not telling no. anybody that they were an optical illusion yeah. well, and they weren't actually trying to visualize it they would never yeah. see it never it would just it. be completely foreign to them so yeah. th this is the goal of uh, what I believe these uh, species are trying to accomplish, right? In Absolutely. order to survive and stay in their own world. Yeah, and they do a really good job. I mean, there's, there's, so along with things like stone mimicry, you know, we've got leaf mimics and probably everybody knows about that. You know, I'll, I'll give you a local example uh, for West Texas. Next time you're out in the south, uh, you know, the low desert and you're wandering along the creosote bushes, um, in the summer, have a look, just spend some time looking all over the bushes and try to find some insects because those things, even though in the heat of the summer or whatever, they're covered with bugs. Oh. And you will find like crazy little stick mimics. You'll find, uh, you know, stick bugs. You'll find little spiders in the yellow flowers that are bright yellow, just like flowers. And the coolest one of all is this tiny little grasshopper mm. that is exactly the same color and shape of creosote bush leaves it's i think it's even called like the creosote grasshopper it's it's only found on creosote what color and it's is even it exactly got, it's that exact same kind of bright green color that creosote gets after a rain mm. so it's not like that brownish green it has whenever it's dry but it's that bright green that it gets after it's wet because you know how mm. creosote changes colors according yeah, it gets real bright when it's active and so it's it's usually it's got to be the summertime. It's got to be, and these these grasshoppers are active in the summertime. So it's going to be, they're generally around them when they're when they're that green color. But they also have, you know, Creasa bush has those. It's kind of got like a weird reddish brown tint to some of the, some of the foliage, some of the green uh, right. like stems along. Yeah. So the, the, the grasshopper has some of those, which makes it look like like between the leaves. There's a bit of this reddish brown color to give it the, uh, it's so good. It's so well camouflaged. And um, wow. yeah, but, and so we got that, you got, you know, rock mimics, thorn mimics, you know, like leaf hoppers that look just like thorns. This is a fun one. There are poop mimics. You heard of these? Uh, those uh, dung beetles kind of. No, so these are, well, so they look exactly like bird poop, kind of that var White. Like variable white and brown or yeah. white and black and they're even weird like um irregularly shaped huh. and there's a couple a couple a lot of insects are poop mimics and there <laughs> are some spiders that are poop mimics and, and this is a good one a, a, a local favorite there's a type of frog in west texas central texas the barking frog which as an adult it's a weird i've sat on a few of those I think. yeah exactly yeah <laughs> this is a good one yeah, so and this is not made up, but it, it belongs to this tropical group of frogs that has um, direct development. So it lays eggs on the land. There's no tadpole stage. Little frog pops out of the egg. And there's only a handful of species in the U.S. that have that kind of reproduction. They're, they belong to a tropical family. Farthest north they get is Texas. 
And the barking frogs in central Texas, as far west as like the Marfa grasslands mm -hmm. or the um, the marathon grasslands. And as a baby, the, the the tiny little froglet is black and white with this variable little pattern, and it looks just like a bird shit. And that's what it's supposed to look like. It's so that <laughs> nothing notices it. And so but, I'm you know, sure just, it's I'm sure it's mom thinks it's beautiful. I, I think they're quite beautiful too, but they're, oh, really? they're supposed to look like shit. Okay. And of course, you know, leaf mimicry doesn't have to be like a bright green leaf. There's lots of things that look like, like the leaves on the forest floor, right? Mm -hmm. The dead leaves. And so there's all kinds of, um, you know, like the poor will, the nocturnal bird. Good luck finding one of those when they're on the forest floor during the daytime hiding. They've got their eyes closed. And they've got this kind of brown, gray, white modeled pattern, and they are invisible on the forest floor during the day. You cannot see them. They look exactly like a bunch of leaves, like a pile of leaves. And especially with their eyes closed, you know, the eyes are often like a huge giveaway. They're very difficult to disguise. So they have like eyelids? Of course. Yeah, it's a bird. So they got eyelids oh, and they, they're okay. sleeping. It's daytime. They're active at night. So they're actually sleeping and they're stock still sleeping on the forest floor and they're invisible. Wow. Um, and, you know, snakes are really good at that kind of camouflage too. the copperhead with that. Even like a, a copperhead in a fish tank looks like this colorful critter, right? It's like orange, mm. pink, brown, like, oh, wow. Yeah. But on the forest floor, it's invisible. Coiled up on the forest floor all those colors look like fall leaves and you can't right. see them. They're one yeah. of the best disguised snakes in the United States, even though they kind of seem like they're bright and colorful. They're not. They're they're really good dead leaf mimics is what they are. Yeah, that's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> when you think about it, you really don't know. And same with the panthers too, like out here, you know, the, the mountain lions. Um, yeah. Because you can feel that you're being stalked by a mountain lion and you can <laughs> look at the, the horizon and look at the rocks but you just can't see it. There's no way. I mean, they're, they're just really came up and it seems like they're all camouflaged like that. You know, yeah. they're just, I mean, there's really a general, there's a general the degree. Yeah. There's a general degree of camouflage yeah. among everything, but like, so what we're talking about here is something where they're actually supposed to look like something, not just right. like a general camouflage. So that's a gotcha. gotcha. sl yeah. slight difference, but yeah, it's, it's basically the same thing. So, and that's a good example of where like you can see how these things could develop over time because mm -hmm. you start with just general camouflage that'll blend you in anywhere. Right. Right. A, a tan coloration in the desert, like a mountain lion. Boom. That's good for all, you know, it's, it's good, just kind of uh, general purpose camouflage. Right. But then you can see how if, if you, if you wanted to, you could go on a trajectory towards a mountain lion, you know, trying to look exactly like a boulder where it has some like, two-toned looks and it's got a you know and it, it starts developing a some sort of a uh you know a behavior of hunching right you know and and getting like and little curling up little stripes that look like cracks or something like that so that's what it would take for a mountain lion to look like a boulder and that's what that's the direction that some of these like stone mimics have taken wow where instead of just like a, a horn lizard that's all one color it's got this counter shading that looks like brick red where it actually looks like it looks more like a rock looks where it's got some shading. Right. Um, and so, and the, and the pebble mim mimics in Australia look just like the pebbles here. So that's a really good, I'm glad you brought up general camouflage. Cause now you can kind of see how this works like over time, over long, you know, you can get this kind of more from general camouflage to resemblance of an inanimate object. And then maybe from there, you can go the even longer path towards resembling an entire other animal and yeah. just to give you an example in the last before we go to break a lot of people might be having a hard time with this because they're like you know is predation really that important like how how much predation goes on out there and we just said that like if you look like a rock maybe the predator ignores you well the predators are good too and in order to feed themselves they got to find food mm -hmm. and to give you an idea of the kind of predation that's out there we we did a study on loggerhead shrikes which are really cool little it's a small uh, perching bird that lives in West Texas. Oh, know, okay. Uh, but they've got this raptorial beak, right? Mm. So they're they're carnivorous, even though they're they're like a songbird, right? They're, they're not that different from like a mockingbird, but they got this car a carnivorous beak, and they've got they don't have talons, so 
they can't rip things apart with their talons. They don't have them. So what they do is they they stick things on barbed wire or other sharp objects and impale them and then use the sharp object to rip the thing apart with their raptorial beak. Uh So you'll find on the barbed wire highways in certain places, West Texas and other places, these impaled grasshoppers and spiders and, (laughs) and lizards and with half their heads eaten off. It's, it's unbelievable. It's brutal, but that gives you an idea. You can go out there. If you find a good place where these birds have been active, you can count the number of prey items per day that they go through. And it's like dozens and it's, and it's hundreds of different species. Vlad the Impaler like, for, for birds. Yeah, including things like black widows, like those hideous sulpugids, the, you know, the, uh, the, the sun scorpions or whatever. All oh, these yes. dangerous looking arthropods, plus lizards, plus horn lizards, all this stuff. And they're just butchering those things by the hundreds. And that's just like one barbed wire fence along one lonesome highway in West Texas. And there are millions of those birds in the United wow. States and they're out there all day. And that's just one species of predatory bird in West Texas. And that gives you an idea of the huge volume of predation that's going on and how that those are the kind of numbers that can lead to these kind of adaptations. Cause if you have millions right. and millions and millions and millions of these things getting murdered every day, <laughs> it's the ones that survive. You're, yeah. You're going to want to look like a rock. That's or, how or, it works. Or a post, you know. That's like, how it works. It's millions wow. of, of murders every day all over the world. My God, just like one hour on CNN. But anyway, <laughs> all right. So we're going to go to a quick commercial break and uh, we'll be back with more uh, nature, mimicry and nature. We're going to be talking about that. All right. We are back. Sean Graham here all the way down in the, in, in the, in the under area. Down under, under. down under, uh, yeah, down under. Uh, with me here on the science nights in the morning, and um, well, we're we've been talking about mimicry in nature, and uh, we started off real slow. You know, we started off with uh, some birds. We talked a little bit about the walking stick, and we also talked about uh, different plants that kind of mimicked rocks in order to survive, mainly from predation. And I know that there are a lot of predators out there that try to take on mimicry in order to uh, get prey, right. To uh, do the old switcheroo switcheroo ski on them. Yeah. That's yeah. That's a special kind of mimicry that we call aggressive mimicry. Uh, And that that's got a good name. That's a good one. It's pretty self-explanatory. And there are some examples of that some really good ones. Um, I'll get the best one. That's kind of a local one is, um, it's not that local to West Texas, but so blue jays are, um, they use like a, a, a vocalization, a mimic. So they're using a, it's not, they're not disguising themselves to look like a predator. Right. They're disguising their voice to sound like a predator to do something cool. So oh, wow. anytime you're, so if you're really good at birding, you can be walking around in the forest and you can hear something like a red tailed hawk or red shouldered hawk. And if you're good, you'll be like, wait, there's something off about that call. What is going on? And then you'll hear right after it, you'll hear. And it's like, oh, that's a blue jay. It's a blue jay mimicking a red tailed hawk. And they're pretty good at it. It's not perfect because most birders can tell right away. They're like, that's just a. And what it's good enough to fool some songbirds. And the whole idea is that they go around the forest up in the up in the forest. and, And blue jays are nasty nest robbers. And what they'll do is they'll they'll make that call and and generally a little songbird on a nest if it hears a red-tailed hawk they'll they'll freak out and they'll start looking around and making little alarm calls and they give their nest position away when they do that because the blue jay is looking for them and they'll spot the little songbird leave its nest and discover the nest and go eat the eggs or the nestlings or all of the above. Wow. And so that's that's a good uh, example of aggressive mimicry. There are good examples of things like um what like spiders that look just like ants so that the ants will come up to them and think they're another ant and then the spider just owns the (laughs) ant devours it yeah that's a that's a good example like more of like what i think you were thinking of with aggressive mimicry i was also thinking kind of the the, the angler fish it it like creates this beacon yeah of of light to attract something 
Yep. And that's, that's a special brand of uh, aggressive mimicry um, where it's like one part of the body of the animal is supposed to lure something. So this is luring. Right. Uh-huh. So there, a, a, angler fish is just the classic example of this, where it'll have like this fleshy projection or even a glowy, glowy thing mm-hmm. that will bring in other fish and they'll just chomp them. This seems to happen in, um, in many organisms that have, this only seems to happen in these animals that are able to eat things much bigger than their own body mass. Uh-huh. And that, and because of that, they go, they only have very infrequent meals, right? So they, they only get a chance to eat like one thing every couple of months. And so they got to make it good. So they, they're way better off just luring things to them. They could just sit there like a fisherman and wait. And so the other group of animals that does luring are snakes. Yeah. It's the same sort of thing. Snakes can eat things bigger than their own head. And they can go months between meals. And so there are snakes that lure with their tail. And we have these in the U.S. Uh, so the pit, the copperhead, when they're when they're born, the copperhead and cottonmouth, mm-hmm. when they're born, are uh, you know pretty brightly colored, but still camouflaged. More brightly colored than the adults, but camouflaged to look like leaves. But sure. the tail is like bright yellow. Yeah. And they'll sit there and wiggle that thing, and it makes it look just like a caterpillar or something. Oh, wow. And so the the behavior goes with the mimicry, right? The tail mimics a caterpillar. The behavior of wiggling it, if they see something coming, even some of our small rattlesnakes, like the Massasaga, mm-hmm. they're born with a tiny little tail that's bright yellow. And so they, they lure with the tail. There's some snakes that lure with their tongue. Like when you think about a snake, yeah. they don't have much to work with right they, they got a tail or a tongue and so they'll stick their tongue out and in, into the water and kind of flick it in a weird pattern and attract fish with it so one of our water snakes is a real good lingual lure uh it it, it lures with its tongue and then some of the big frogs that have huge heads uh that eat infrequent meals they eat that the huge head allows them to eat things like other frogs or even mice with their head so infrequent meals and not very, they don't eat very often. They'll they'll lure with their toes, <laughs> and this is fun to watch. And these are super camouflage frogs. Like they're yeah. they're on the rainforest, uh, things like the horned frogs of South America, uh, and, and they they look exactly like forest floor. They'll look like a bunch of leaves, or they'll look like bright green moss, and they're totally camouflaged. And then they've just got this little toe. In some cases, it's their back toe. They'll like reach over their back leg near their Whoa. face. And really? wriggle their little pinky toe and wait for something to come along and then chow down on it. So that's pedal luring, luring wow. with their toes. And so that's that's a bunch of different kind of luring. You know, the snapping turtle with its tongue, that's another example. It's all over the place. That's awesome. That's awesome. So let's get into the nitty gritty. Let's get mm-hmm. into, you know, these species that literally, literally, not figuratively, but straight up look exactly like what they're trying to look like. Yeah. So this is, a, this is when we're talking about mimicry, this is usually what we're talking about. All these other things we talked about um, may go into separate categories, but this is like the main type of mimicry we mean when we say mimicry. And there's, there's basically two kinds and they're impossible to remember which is which, but it, it's always some sort of like poisonous or venomous species that's very dangerous uh, and a non-toxic or harmless species that has evolved to look just like the dangerous one, right? Mm-hmm. Or in another case, so that that case where it's like a false advertisement, that's Batesian mimicry, right? Where where you've got the non-toxic species disguised to look like a toxic one. Right. And you know the, the the classic example of this, which has lately undergone kind of a revision is the monarch butterfly and the viceroy, right? right? And the monarch is, it, everyone knows, is toxic. It eats butterfly weed and other milkweeds, and milkweeds are, are toxic. Nobody, mm. you, you get that milky secretion. Uh, so this is one of those cases of an herbivore that has um, managed to counteract a very good defense by you know evolving enzymes and things to cope with it. And then they even become toxic because they're feeding on a toxic plant. So the caterpillars of monarch butterflies are super toxic. They're also very brightly colored. Um, and so what happens here is a couple of couple things going on. Uh, 
usually these toxic you know models for the mimic end up becoming brightly colored and that's called aposematic coloration or aposematism mm-hmm. as uh, so it's like it's it's this uh bright color to kind of reinforce the bad experience that a predator will have and so that's why that happens and that kind of makes sense from an evolutionary standpoint it's a, that's an advertisement by the toxic species to say hey I am going to light you up if you try to try to eat me. I'm going to yeah. fry your face. It's going to hurt. It's going to melt it's going off. To, it, it's going to burn your tongue, or it might very well just kill you. So yeah. and so, predators, herbivores, apparently, and there's good experimental evidence of this. This works. We know that you know uh, you can you can feed like a blue jay some monarch butterflies, and they'll they'll go after it. If they're naive, if they're you know just hatched out, mm-hmm. uh, they'll go after a monarch and then they'll spit it out because it's it tastes like ass. And then uh, if you if you feed them another one, they'll reject it. So they learn like in one try. That's all it takes. Wow. So that's so that's why all these toxic and, and venomous species often are brightly colored because that seems to work. And this and they they have all kind of converged on the same colors. Right, reds, oranges, yellows. This is probably because birds and humans and primates all see really well in that spectrum. Not many mm. other things do. So it's really it's probably birds and primates that are among the most important, you know, uh, drivers of this kind of mimicry and this mm. kind of warning coloration. Yeah. So, Speak- and the viceroy. Viceroy butterfly supposedly for the longest time was thought to be uh, perfectly palatable. It turns out it may actually be toxic too, which would mean this is not a good case of Batesian mimicry. Right. It's a case of this other kind of mimicry that's less popular, less famous, called Mullerian mimicry. And hmm. this is where you have two toxic species that merge on the same coloration because then it you only have to teach a predator once. Yeah. Right. So you you can have this a suite of butterflies that converge on this like bright red coloration, orange, black, and and they look like each other because it makes sense for them to all look the same so that they don't have to all spend their time teaching the predator. Only one of them has to teach the predator once and then he he'll won't be fooled by any of them anymore. So right. Mullerian mimicry is true, you know, there's truth in advertising. And this, you know, supposedly the viceroy and monarch may actually be a really good example of that there's better examples a lot of our salamanders that are toxic are bright red and they all seem to be toxic and they all seem to the the most toxic of the lot is this thing called a uh, a red eft it's a stage of a newt that lives in the eastern u.s they're found in east texas too Mm -hmm. and these things are so toxic you'll see red f's in some places are bright red They'll be waltzing along on the forest floor in broad daylight, a salamander, <laughs> yeah. like like they own the place. Just, <laughs> just kicking the door in. Just like they could you know? care. Le- and it's like anything comes along and puts that in his mouth gets fried and they spit wow, it out immediately. Really? And so, yeah. And there's some other salamanders that probably aren't as toxic, but it makes sense that if you're, if you look like a red eft. Yeah. Then, then every every it works out best for everyone. You got VIP so, status. Yeah. So the red salamander, the mud salamander, the red F, the spring salamander, some some of uh, color patterns of red backs. They're all they all converged on that red color, probably because they're all kind of toxic, taste terrible. And there are some there are some salamanders that that are uh, that the birds can't eat, and they're mm. and they're brown, and so. There, there's one case of a mimicry uh, of, of an example of mimicry in salamanders where it's actually Batesian mimicry, <clears throat> Mullerian all over the place, lots of red salamanders. But there's a really cool salamander in the Great Smokies, where it's uh, it's got a red cheek patch, so it's just a it's just like a little badge on the cheek. And there's a toxic version, and there's a non-toxic version that belongs to a completely different group of fairly edible salamanders, and it's got a red cheek patch too. So that's like a perfect example of Batesian mimicry. And that's one that we've got pretty good experimental evidence to support that it's, you know, one is toxic, one isn't, and it's mimicking the other. They did a, a series of experiments using blue jays as the dupe. And it's like, it, it's exactly what you'd predict. 
you feed a blue jay the toxic red cheek, spits it out, never touches another red cheek. Right. You feed a naive one the non-toxic red cheek, it'll eat it <clears throat> until it gets to a toxic one, and then it spits that one out and never eats another red cheek again. Wow. So boom, the experimental evidence supports it like 100%. <laughs> what is the timeline in evolutionary like terms uh how long does it take for that to really kind of take place for it to develop i mean something as intricate as like a red cheek like that yeah and they're really like if you look at a picture of these two it's pretty and you can you can go out there in the great smoky mountains like tomorrow they're really common both of them flip rocks on any of the trails and you'll find you'll find one or the other and they're they're almost equally common. So uh, the red cheek and then the imitator salamander is what they call the non-toxic one. And like, I'll bet if you looked at them, you'd probably go, well, yeah, I can kind of see how that's a different species. For somebody like me, like being an expert on salamanders, I can tell like exactly which one belongs to which group because wow. there, there are certain cool. features. But like for a novice, you'd still kind of go, yeah, it doesn't look exactly right. But that red cheek patch is really obvious on both of them. Wow. And to be honest, I have no idea how long something like that would take. You know, it would be generations, yeah. you know, thousands. I guess thousands, it depends on predation, of of years. right? Yeah. Yeah. In the environment. And, and it also, you know, this, I always think about those, that example, the red cheek salamander, the imitator. One of the things we often forget when we think about these studies is like that, that experiment that they did to confirm that wasn't perfect because Often what is not really considered when we think about these systems is who the dupe is supposed to be, right? Mm. Like a blue jay, both those salamanders, they're not like the red eft. They don't hang out in broad daylight. They're hiding right. under rocks. Yeah. So blue jay in, would probably never see one of these salamanders. They don't flip over rocks looking for food. <clears throat> bears probably do. Mm. And so bears, especially with their ability to see kind of up close, not very good from far, far distances. I could see bears being a really good dupe for that system. They could have been the driver or maybe wild turkeys, maybe yeah. roughed grouse because they're both feeding in the ground. Uh, so those it would be really cool if we kind of studied it from the predator's perspective a yeah. little bit more than when we, we, we just kind of assume. But it, it works with blue jays, so that, that gives you some evidence. But I still think there's sometimes a piece missing. Yeah. Well, uh, I don't know if you know this, but I, I had a pet salamander once and, uh, and he didn't have a red cheek. Uh, he had dimples. Uh, we, we called him Bernie cause he looked just like the guy at weekend at Bernie's the dead guy, the, and, dead, uh, guy. the dead guy at weekend at Bernie's the movie oh, yeah, remember yeah. That in the nineties. Yeah, of course. Of and, course. Uh, and he has that little dimple, you know, that yeah. little yeah. smile. He has that little yeah. smirk and, uh, the salamander Bernie, we fed him tomato i mean we fed him so much he was real fat and then one day we lost him he was just gone oh, no. oh, and then no. like two weeks later we found him uh behind um behind our uh tv center like you know back when we had tv centers you know that oh yeah a and, dust uh, bunny yeah yeah he was back there and he was just as thin as a little pencil so yeah. we uh we fed him again and then my dad actually took him to a uh terrarium that they had at the uh, research center <laughs> that he was at. So uh, he lived a good life, but it was yeah. fun. I love salamanders. Uh anyway, awesome. we have about like 5 minutes left in the segment. I know we're going to get into even more good examples of uh, natural mimicry. What else you got for us? Yeah, so some of the other really obvious ones, you know, this the Batesian mimicry thing was discovered by a guy named Bates and so they named it after him or and he he is the first to suggest it and he studied he studied butterflies in the Amazon hmm. and and butterflies are really good you know there's this whole group of butterflies uh that feeds on like passion flower fruits passion flower vines and and for like every single species of passion flower there's a a heliconius butterfly and they're all they're all mimics well they're all colorful bright colorful with warning coloration and there's just you know a couple of uh non-poisonous versions of butterflies that that are you know go along with them so if you're in the amazon and you're a bird you have no idea what to do and and they're all all the <laughs> heliconius butterflies are mullerian mimic mimics of each other uh -huh. right they all look the same as each other and then there's all these 
you know, mimics that, that aren't toxic that look like them. So it's a total mess. So that's kind of the classic example. But another one closer to home is the good old uh, coral snake, huh. right? Yeah. Coral snakes uh, are, you know, belong to the, uh, the cobra family. Uh, in the uh, in the Western Hemisphere, we basically have either pit vipers or coral snakes if they're venomous. And so coral snakes uh, are common in Central South America, and we have a handful that get up into the USA. Uh, you know, the Texas coral snake, which occurs in East Texas. So that's the closest one to West Texas. There's none in West Texas. And then there's one in Arizona. Um, and And there's been really good studies that have shown that, like, there's tons of mimics that are non-venomous that occur mostly throughout the range of where coral snakes are. So there's a couple where they're just outside the range of coral snakes and they're still there. So the ranges don't have to be perfectly corresponding for it to work, right? So scarlet king snakes in Florida have exactly the same color pattern. And, you know, everybody learns the, uh, the, the, the rhyme red and yellow kill a fellow right because it's Red, that black, that, like, black yeah yeah you have to you have to learn a childhood rhyme to remember and like this is great uh, i was watching there's a youtube video out there it might still be out there of some kids in texas and they're handling a coral snake oh, and it, no. like to me it's like very obviously a coral snake because if you get good you, you don't even have to know the rhyme you can just kind of tell by the head shape sure but it's like sure. that's a freaking coral snake and they've got it in their hand and they're playing with it and they're yeah. going they're and they're saying the rhyme oh. and they're saying and they're saying the rhyme correctly they're saying red and yellow kill a fellow red and be- red and black venom black or friend of jack yeah and and the only thing they're doing wrong is not looking at the colors on the snake <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're not actually looking to see which colors touch because if oh they would gosh. if they had they would see that they were in danger a lot of danger sometimes those yellow stripes have a little a tiny little black border so you're really not sure yeah Yeah. and every now and then you know this is for connoisseurs but every now and then um you can get weird uh like you know aberrant colored you know versions of the coral snake where it's like melanistic Mm. where it's like completely black oh wow and then it you know then you're really that's like like a water moccasin or something Right. It's like, it would look like, you know, I'm sure somebody would just call it a black snake. Yeah. And you know, fortunately, most people think that every freaking snake there is, is deadly venomous. <laughs> so they, they just leave them all alone or try to kill them all. Yeah. But, you know, a totally black coral snake would, would certainly, uh, you know, fool you. And of course that rhyme doesn't work where there's more coral snakes. So if you go into Central America, South America, forget that rhyme because there are coral snakes where it's like just red and black bands. There are coral snakes where red and yellow, where red and black touch, um, and then there's yellow bands as well. And so it's it you know the color that 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 works for American like U.S. species of coral snakes only, and don't take that rhyme traveling with you because you could get in some big trouble. Yeah, but it's yeah. amazing how how well that works because like in the places in South America where there's red and black banded coral snakes, yeah. there are red and black banded non-venomous snakes Hmm. and in north america where there are red black and yellow coral snakes there are red black and yellow mimics and this works across the range of the coral snakes where whatever the local flavor of coral snake is there is a non-venomous mimic to go with it and that's a it's a really good example of you know false advertisement batesian mimicry these things are supposed to look like and it you know it works you know, snakes, there's good examples of like birds, birds that have attacked coral snakes and gotten bitten have died. You know? Wow. Uh, they, it, it definitely works. And of course, in order for the system to work, it's better if the bird doesn't die, but actually teaches its babies to right. avoid hey, the don't, snake. Don't, right? Yeah. But still like killing, killing the potential predator still is pretty good. But it would be better if you just really messed it up so that it didn't come after you the second time. Because that's that's how the mimicry part works. Right. In order for the mimicry part works, there has to be either learning or some sort of experiment or, or, or experience. Or it has to even be better where like there's like something like almost like culture going on where the bird or mammal is teaching its babies. And that's even yeah. better because then you've not only taught one thing a lesson, you've taught a whole family a lesson. Right. Yeah. How how to avoid uh, 
getting really messed up 101 uh, right. the syllabi and then, yeah maybe over really long evolutionary time you could have some sort of instinctual uh right. thing happening where it's no longer learning but any bird sees a red black and yellow snake just avoids it it doesn't know why but it's you know it's evolved that way because so many of them died trying to kill the coral snake. Sure. All right, cool. Well, uh, we have another commercial break. We'll be right back, and uh, when we come back, we're going to talk more about mimicry in nature. Fun stuff. All right, we are back. Science night in the morning. Yep, we have uh, Dr. Sean Graham here. We're talking about mimicry in nature, and uh, you know I'm sure a lot of people have probably seen or come across this online. They're really native to uh, India, North India, uh, and China area, Taiwan, Japan. Uh, but it's a very interesting moth that is nocturnal, and uh, they call it the owl moth. And um, this thing, when turned upside down, so uh, on its, uh, this moth has a set of four wings, right? Two on each side. And on the bottom wing, part of the wings, it has these two bright uh, circles. And the circle look is on the outside of the circle. The ring of it is bright yellow. And on the inside, literally looks like an iris with a shining bead of light on it in some cases. So it looks exactly like an eye of an owl. And uh, this uh, moth is really cool looking. When it hangs upside down uh, on like a piece of foliage that kind of resembles what a moth would look like, uh, this owl moth, uh, it looks exactly almost identical to a, uh, a moth. And it's really, really cool. Um, and, and it's a, a form of defense, right? We're that's what we've been talking about. Yeah, that's a really interesting one, and that's that's pretty widespread. It's it's not um, just in one kind of moth somewhere. Now there may be one, the one you're describing, maybe one that's uncannily looking like a moth. I, I I just looked at one on Google, and I I I have to confess, I'm not sure if it's a Photoshop job. It's it's it, so it's either really remarkable, or it's Photoshop, but. <laughs> There, the, the idea that moths have these eyes on their wings, that's common. And it's not just in like some random place. Even in right. North America, we have them. the IO moth. And so there's a couple things going on. A lot of moths will have these bright colors under their wings. And this is supposed to, this is called flash coloration. There's a bunch of critters that have this. And this is a, kind of in a separate category. But, you know, they'll be super cryptic sitting there on a bark of a tree or something, uh, totally disguised. The idea is that if, if a bird comes in and tries to get you and you've been you've been had, you've been outed, then you flash these underwings. It's got, like you said, it's got four pairs of wings. Mm -hmm. So the underwings have, will have bright colors and this will startle your potential predator. So even frogs have this. They'll have bright colors on their thighs mm. and they, the same thing like a totally cryptic looking frog, bright colors on the thighs. So when it jumps away, right, you're seeing its butt, and its thighs and it's brightly colored. So it, it just freaks out the bird. I think yeah. it probably works. We don't have, we have basically no experimental evidence that this works. Nobody's ever like set up an experiment with like blue jays or something and done some sort of manipulation. Like, you know, you, you can imagine how you can manipulate this, right? You could just take sure. an, an IO moth and like cover its underwings and see if the bird just nails it yeah. and then and then see what happens when you uncover it and make it the big eyes but sure. in general the eyes are interesting in nature like i said really hard to disguise them no matter how well you disguise them they're still there if yeah. they're open right and so you, like it's the hardest thing you can disguise everything else but the eyes are there right but you can use them to your advantage like you said things don't like to be looked at Right? They don't like the staring eyes. And so if you've got a pair of eyes, say, on the back of your head or right. on your ass, yeah, right, because you're always getting attacked from behind. Every predator knows that that's the best way to go. Yeah, you're, It's where you're least defensive. You're not going to get bitten if you get them on the butt. So there's like frogs that will puff themselves up and lift their ass up in the face of a predator and have a pair of eyes there. Wow. Ass eye. There you go. And that's and it probably freaks out same thing here with the moths they got the eyes um and really cool you brought up owls there are owls with eyes on the back of their head well so like the i thought they owl, just spun their head around 
Oh, well, they can do that too, but still like they can't do it at once. Right. So they can be looking the other way yeah. and still have a pair of eyes in the back of their heads. Wow. And uh, so if you look at it, there's a great picture of a pygmy owl out there. And this is one, I think, I think you can find it in Texas certain time of year. And it's got this kind of yellowish black and it, from a distance, it looks like the owl is looking right at you and it's got his head turned around the other side. <laughs> um, and even things like if you like a bobcat. You ever notice how Bobcat has those black and white, cool looking oh, things yeah. in the back of its ears? That's right. I think it's the same thing. You think about like, you know, those people in Bangladesh that walk around in, in the Sundermans and if Honor Bob was here, he'd be able to tell us all about it. Those There's those dudes that go walking around the mangrove swamps that are infested with tigers and they wear those paper mache masks on the back of their head with wow. eyes. Really? Because they, they, they're convinced that a tiger will only attack you if you're turned around, not looking at it. I wow. think they're right, especially wow. cats. Cats hate eyes, or they love them, right? Yeah. Cats like make eyes at you when they love you. <laughs> oh but yeah, it, like they hate being stared at if they don't like you. Mm-hmm. So a lot of cats have these eyes in the back of their head, and I think that's part of the thing. Like they'll they'll get attacked by a rival cat unless the cat thinks they're already be, they've been seen, and then they won't do it. And so I think that's th- th- this is an example of something we call auto mimicry. Is this where you mimic? yourself or part of yourself right and so if you have eyes on the back of your head that's your own eyes you're mimicking that's auto mimicry uh there's other examples like a rubber boa in the u.s has a tail that mimics its own head and so it's like a two-sided snake wow so and it'll even it'll probe like if you if you try to catch a rubber boa its head its real head will go under a rock and try to disappear and find an escape route its tail, meanwhile, will sit there and you know, like rub itself into your arm, and it's got like it's it's been attacked before, so it's like scarred back there. Oh, and wow. it's got all these wounds and stuff, so it's like really hard. And it's and it's totally it doesn't need the tail. If it loses the tail, it could care less, right? It doesn't regrow it, right. but it doesn't need it. So you can attack that tail all you want. So and the tail is sitting there pretending to be a head. That's auto mimicry. Wow. <laughs> So it can lose its tail and be fine. It can, yeah, most snakes can lose their tails. Even a rattlesnake could lose its tail and be fine. It, it wouldn't be able to rattle anymore, but it would survive. It'll heal yeah. over. It moved to it the bongos or something. Yeah, it won't grow back, but it, it it'll be. It'd rather lose its tail than its head. That's true. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true. So those are some pretty. So we're growing up to really incredible examples, and I think we could probably all we can end on a couple of really bizarre examples of Sweet. mimicry. And so. If you think about mostly what we've talked about is visual mimicry, but there's any kind of the senses that vertebrate vertebrates have could potentially be used to screw around with, you know, mimicry. And so there's mimicry, the, the probably the most bizarre sensory mode of any vertebrate is the electric eel, which uses the electromagnetic spectrum and like basically electricity to find its prey. And of mm. course, they've 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 used it also to be able to create enough voltage to use it as a defense mechanism, and they can produce enough volts to electrocute you. But they wow. mostly use it to find their prey because their prey are using electric pulses for communication, and electric eels are out there listening in wow. on the other electric fishes and using little chirps <sighs> that are the same frequency as the others to. Th- fool them into thinking come on over it's fine the water's I'm your fine mate. i'm your mate i want to yeah. i want to have sex with you come in and, it. and then yeah. it nails them so the electric eel uses electric mimicry to lure in prey that's pretty wow. crazy okay here's another one so there's these uh little fish in the coral reefs that are cleaner fishes so they spend they sit there and advertise their little posts and the big fish come up and the little clean and the big fish know all about the cleaner fish. They're like it's like a gas station to them. They go up there. The cleaner fish will take off old dead scales. They'll take off parasites of the fish. They'll take off gunk between their teeth. And something like a big, you know, a big fish will go in there, opens its mouth up for a little cleaner ras, W R A S S E, a ras, mm. to feed off of all of its crud and then move on. So the cleaner ras sits there and waits. And it's got a sp- particular coloration. It's got like striped yellow, blue, real pretty little fish. Now there's another fish called a saber tooth blenny. <laughs> That's a clue. Sounds very it English. Looks, it looks equal. Well, the saber tooth part sounds yeah. vicious. And it is. Yeah. It's got these huge fangs. 
And they sit there and they look exactly like a cleaner wrasse. They've got the same color pattern. They mimic them. And a cleaner, a, a fish that wants a cleaning will go up and it'll even mimic the behavior, the little, like, you know, uh, enthusiastic behavior and set up its station, wait there for a big fish. And then when the big fish comes, it lunges out, grabs a hunk out of it, and then oh takes off. Oh, my gosh. It's a parasite, basically, and it mimics a cleaner fish to get close to its prey. And they don't, it's a huge like grouper that it's feeding off of. It's not, it can't eat the grouper. It's just taking a big chunk and then <laughs> swimming away. So that's the mimicry between cleaner wrasses and saber tooth blennies. And that's, wow. a, that's a pretty good one. That's really even, cool. Even the fireflies that you love. There's a, there's a diabolical example. And this one's kind of more of a visual thing. So with all those, uh, you know, bioluminescent organisms, there's there's opportunity for mimicry there because really what's going on with the fireflies there's you know a bunch of species and they they have those little pulses and they're they're done at a certain frequency to to uh to advertise for mating that's what it's for it's just like birds calling or frogs calling they're glowing to advertise for mating and so the males will be sitting there pulsing away there's another species where the 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 i think it's the female of another species mimics the pulse rate of a different species for a, of a, so that the males will come in looking for opportunities and then she eats them succubus that's <laughs> so a succubus right there. that's another another example of aggressive mimicry my goodness fireflies and so yeah there's there's just so many different kinds and you know we are only scratching the surface because we, we did a whole show and almost every example had to do with something visual. Yeah. Right. We had w like one example where it was auditory with the blue Jays calling. And I think then we had the well, electric my, pulses. Oh, electric pulses. Yeah. But there's a huge world that we don't really have a good handle on. And that's with smell. Olfactory mimicry has to be everywhere in nature because you know mammals mostly use olfaction that's the that's the sense they're best at uh lots of snakes and lizards they their whole world is through olfaction uh uh, uh salamanders their whole world is through olfaction and lots of fish you know uh, visual orientation is is important for reef fish right where they have clear water and it's that beautiful reef environment where there's lots of light penetration it's colorful so uh, there's mimicry like that example we just said about the saber tooth plenty that's on a reef but yeah. think about all the places where the fish are like it's totally dark they're in a cave it's in a river with sediment where you can't see anything so uh, probably a majority of the mimicry in nature is probably from the perspective of the nose and it's where we have the least capacity to understand it because our nose totally sucks. Yeah. We, How we do don't... fish smell? They... Same same way we do. They've got a nose. They just it's exactly they just, the like, same breathe, system. Breathe in the. Yeah. So they've got nostrils, and it's like a instead of where the where it's like a, the nostrils are associated with breathing and smelling like ours. Yeah. Their nostrils just do the smelling because their oh, their gotcha. gills are getting aerated by a completely separate structure right the gills yeah. uh, the operculum oh the part that you see bobbing up and down when a fish is breathing underwater but they they're smelling through those little nostrils on their face and it's just like a little one-way valve it goes straight through but there's a a little nasal epithelium there just like the one in the roof of your nose that works exactly the same way and that we inherited our nasal epithelium epithelium from fish so it works exactly the same way Wow. Of course, they they can they they use all ver uh, other kinds of things to taste the chemistry in their environment. So catfish have those barbels, uh, and well, I would know, think suckers, that the fish smell have... would be more like a taste. Yeah, well, it, it is exactly like smell, but there are some fish that do things more like taste, and so whiskers and uh, the lips of suckers are more like it's more like tasting. Hmm. But they still they have they they smell the water just like like you would if you wow. if you could. Yeah, it's exactly the same way. It's a cool. it's a nostril. Next time I'm yeah. underwater, I'm gonna try to smell something. <laughs> you can even I, turtles can do that too, which is amazing. If you watch it next time, you look at your little red-eared slider at, a, yeah. at the pet shop. Watch them underwater. They'll sit there and their 
their little chin will go up and down while they're underwater. Right. They're yeah, not breathing. That. If they if they if they breathe the water, they would drown. Yeah. But they can they can you know inhale little bits of water into their oral cavity through their nostril and then push it right back out. Oh. And so they can sit there pump water through their mouth through their nostril, you know, tasting and smelling the water without breathing it. Huh. And that's what they're doing. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, great episode, man. I uh, appreciate yeah. it. Any, mimicry, anything you want to wrap up nature. with? No, just uh, that we need we need uh, digital noses so that we can start studying the olfactory mimicry that's all around us. So, well, next you time tech, you, uh, you download... tech whizzes need to get on that. <laughs> well, next time you download an app, uh, just try to sniff it out and see see what's <laughs> up with it. Taste it. You know, lick your phone every once in a while. See, so go go cutting edge. That's the first step. That, that's <laughs> what we're about here, man. All right. Well, another great episode of Science Nights in the Morning. We'll see you next week. Thanks for listening to this episode of Science Nights in the Morning. Be sure and follow us on Patreon for exclusive gear and uncut episodes. Check out the latest science articles on our Facebook page and subscribe to us on YouTube and your favorite podcast listening app. You can also listen every Saturday at 10 a.m. Central Standard Time at BigBenRadio.com. And if you got a question, we'll join the discussion. Hit the hotline at 432-217-1983 and record your message. We couldn't do this without you, and thank you so much for listening each and every week. That's Science Nights in the Morning with a K, and we'll see you next time.